Welcome to another exciting segment of McMaster's Demystifying Medicine. I'm Matt. And I'm Susie. And today we'll be focusing on pollution and its effects on our breathing. It's a nice Tuesday afternoon, so like always, you decide to make the best of it by logging on to Facebook. As you scroll through your news feed, you come across the following quote. If you really think that the environment is less important than the economy, try holding your breath while you count your money. And this gets you thinking, is our environment really this bad? Why does it affect our breathing? Today, we'll answer all of these questions. If you think today's environment is bad, well let's just say we're glad we aren't living in London in the 1950s. This era was London's darkest history, literally. Due to the excessive use of coal for domestic and industrial purposes, the air became critically polluted, especially during the week of December 6, 1952. During this week, death rate increased three times for both adults and children, primarily due to respiratory and heart conditions. For instance, there was a ninefold increase in death from bronchitis. Even domesticated animals such as cows brought from agricultural fare fell victim to the respiratory illness. The situation started to improve with the enactment of the Clean Air Act in 1956, which placed regulations on fuel use. Its major breakthrough was banning burning of coal for domestic heating. So, why does pollution affect our breathing exactly? Today, we'll be discussing lung defenses, air pollution, types of air pollutants, and of course, a summary of the presented information. Due to the numerous types of gases and particles we inhale on a daily basis, it is not surprising that our lungs have developed many ways to protect itself from harm. The structure of the lungs allows filtration of the air as it enters. The air enters the lungs in a branching system of smaller airways which help filter out larger particles. These particles are mostly left out and the larger airways get coughed up. The remainder particles that may manage to enter the smaller airways get caught in the mucus produced by the goblet cells on the walls of the bronchi. With the help of cilia, the particles are carried out of the lungs through a rhythmic pattern to pump the mucus lining upward. Now, what about infection agents such as bacteria? Glad you asked! Macrophages are responsible for maintaining law and order of the lungs. Any bacteria or infection agent that tempers with the law of the lungs get gobbled up by macrophages. Moreover, additional security is also available in the form of immune system reserves, which are triggered if any particle manages to enter the airway walls. Despite the defenses of the lungs, respiratory illnesses are still very common, largely due to pollution. Next, let's talk about air pollution. For the longest while, mankind did not consider how their lifestyle was affecting the environment up until the London disaster in 1952. Now, as previously mentioned, for four days, the city was engulfed in a thick layer of smog because of the combined effects of airborne pollutants and the weather. Sadly, hundreds of people died from the tragedy. From this dreadful experience, scientists have taken air pollution more seriously and are conducting research into how to make our air cleaner. Believe it or not, there are many ways to classify air pollutants, but the two main ones are by micrograms per cubic meter of air for large particles and by parts per million for smaller gas particles. However, classifying particles is just one aspect. The other is determining how these toxic pollutants affect us. Now, did you know that a person with asthma is more susceptible to the effects of pollution compared to those who are not? Unfortunately, their airways are more narrow and become inflamed at lower pollution levels compared to the average individual. On a final note, the severity of air pollution is affected by many variables, including geographic location, temperature, weather, and the amount of local emissions from industry and motor traffic. If all of the conditions are right, we might end up with a region covered in thick smog for days. I wouldn't want to breathe in that stuff. Speaking of stuff, let's talk about some types of pollutants. Most of the chemical gases that affect our health are oxides produced by combustion. The first major oxide to be recognized as hazardous to our health was sulfur dioxide, which was formed as a byproduct of burning fossil fuels such as coal, which contains sulfur as an impurity. Since the London disaster, research has been done to determine how dangerous sulfur dioxide is to our health. Scientists have found that higher levels of sulfur dioxide in the air were associated with the increased daily death rates during the four-day smog that was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. Also, researchers have determined that cities that have an average annual concentration of at least 0.04 parts per million of sulfur dioxide have an increased incidence of chronic bronchitis. Based on these findings, countries have tried to reduce the use of coal and find alternative ways of producing clean energy. Carbon monoxide is perhaps the greatest pollutant in terms of how much it's damaged our atmosphere. How much do you ask? Well, it's in tons. Additionally, the majority of carbon monoxide is produced by items that we use for our day-to-day activities. For example, automobiles, which reduce large amounts of carbon monoxide 
the process of combustion. Interestingly, in the 19th century, our favorite French physiologist, Claude Bernard, discovered the killing effect of carbon monoxide. He discovered that carbon monoxide tightly binds to a hemoglobin molecule forming carboxyhemoglobin. This replaces the oxygen molecule that binds to hemoglobin, thereby prohibiting oxygen transport in the body. Although it's extremely rare to be harmed by environmental carbon monoxide because of the low level of carboxyhemoglobin, you can directly increase carboxyhemoglobin levels by up to 15% by smoking cigarettes. Moreover, carbon monoxide is such a lethal killer that a number of people died because they accidentally stuck their heads in the oven. Yikes! There goes my baking lessons. Similar to carbon monoxide, there is another culprit which is responsible for polluting our air, and this is nitric oxide. However, we should think twice about that statement since more than 80% of the air we breathe is made up of nitrogen, and only 20% is made up of oxygen. So how do nitrogen oxides pollute our atmosphere? Well, nitrogen in the air that we breathe gets oxidized into nitrogen oxides via combustion reactions in automobiles. Again, it should also be mentioned that nitric oxide also mixes with water to produce nitrous and nitric acids. Lastly, alongside the hydrocarbons released from automobiles, nitric oxides are responsible for creating photochemical smog, which is an invisible layer of pollutants that produces many respiratory complications. <coughs> now that really took my breath away. Speaking of nitrogen dioxide, it is also involved in producing another potentially harmful gas in our environment. Can you think of what this gas may be? Of course you know what it is. It's ozone. Under the influence of solar energy, an oxygen atom breaks off from nitrogen dioxide yielding nitrogen oxide and atomic oxygen. This single oxygen atom binds to molecular oxygen thus forming ozone. Remember how I said it's potentially harmful? That's because ozone is formed this way. In its ground level, a free radical is able to damage living cells and their contents. This is in comparison with ozone formed at higher altitudes, which act as a protective barrier against UV radiation. Since first being termed ozone in the 1820s by Christian Friedrich Chopin, we've learned a lot about this pungent gas, ranging from its chemical properties including its intense corrosiveness, to its effects on the aviation industry, such as deteriorating rubbers in aircraft, and inducing chest tightness and cough, thus the invention of pressurized cabins. Ozone, that enters the lungs, can lead to an inflammation and increased reactivity of the smooth muscle lining the airways, through destroying the delicate membranes therein. This can lead to further complications, such as pneumonia. Let's now stop for a minute and review what we've learned so far. Up to now, we have considered the following pollutants. Sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and ozone. All of these gases are considered particles and exist in the air we breathe as an infinite entity. In other words, we live amongst a combination of pollutants. While some may seem harmless, others can be very dangerous, especially acidic particles. They are widely distributed and causes injuries and inflammation as acid is deposited in the lungs. It is difficult to say that the cause of one effect is due to one form of pollutant, because they work together to create a lasting and stronger effect. Such outcomes include asthma and pneumonitis. Whether it be particles from animals or plants, the number of pollutants involved in causing such outcomes are so vast to the point where respirologists themselves have lost track of these numbers. These particles stick around for such a long time that it was once reported in a small remote island that even though the last cat on the island had died 25 years previously, inhabitants still suffer from asthma due to cat allergies. Well, that's all we have for today, folks. Thank you guys for listening, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode for Demystifying Medicine. Feel free to click, follow, or even subscribe. Check us out on Facebook, or visit our website at www.demystifyingmedicine.ca. See ya! Bye, guys!